It's pretty hard to find a series that elicits as much of an emotional response from people as Pokemon, which isn't that much of an out there statement considering that it's by far the highest grossing multimedia franchise of all time. This fact is even more impressive considering that the franchise didn't get its start until 1996, which was nearly half a century after some of its toughest competition, such as Mickey Mouse, Batman, or Looney Tunes. You can pretty much slap these little monsters on anything and it'll be guaranteed to sell. From cartoons, to manga, to trading cards, to plushies, there really is no short of things that can be found when it comes to Pokemon. Today we're going to take a trip back to the past for one of the most nostalgic games of all time, Pokemon Red and Blue. So just what was it about these games that made Pokemon such a phenomena? Do these games still ultimately hold up today? And what were these games' lasting legacy? Well, let's talk about Pokemon Red and Blue. Development for Pokemon Red and Blue can really be traced back to as early as 1990 when game developer Satoshi Tajiri pitched the idea to Nintendo modeling the concept off of one of his favorite pastimes in his youth bug collecting. Long story short, many Nintendo executives thought that the idea may be a little bit too overly ambitious, and they didn't see the appeal behind the idea. All heads to Nintendo except for Shigeru Miyamoto, who actually helped convince Nintendo to see this idea through. During the development process, special attention was given to the Game Boy Link cable, as Tajiri believed that this would act as a revolutionary idea to trade Pokemon between players, with Miyamoto suggesting that the different Pokemon be split up to different versions to encourage this feature. Ken Sugimori and Atsuko Noshida acted as two of the main artists drawing all 151 Pokemon from multiple angles to give developer Game Freak in order to properly render the creatures in-game. And with music being composed by Junichi Masuda, using the Game Boy's limited sound channels, the development for Pokemon was underway. Pokemon Red and Green were first initially released in Japan on the Game Boy in February of 1996, with a slightly updated version called Pokemon Blue being released as a Japan exclusive in October of that same year. This version would be brought over to the Western audiences in September of 1998 with the release of Pokemon Red and Blue. The game's scored a strong 88 on game rankings. IGN's Craig Harris was quoted as saying, Even if you finish the quest, you still might not have all the Pokemon in the game. The challenge to catch them all is truly the game's biggest draw. While GameSpot's Peter Bartholo said, As an RPG, the game is accessible enough for newcomers to the genre to enjoy, but it will entertain hardcore fans as well. It's easily one of the best Game Boy games to date. Sales-wise, it was ridiculously successful, with Pokemon Red, Blue, and Green selling over 10 million copies before the game even left Japan. That meant one out of every 13 people in Japan had a copy of Pokemon, which is absolutely insane. And in the United States, the game performed just as well, with 14 million being sold by 1998, and an additional 6 million being sold with the following year. For those not there, or that were too young to remember, Pokemon in the late 90s and early 2000s really was a phenomenon, and it all started with Red and Blue. Now, the series has had over 20 years to develop, experiment, and refine its formula, but the core of what makes the series so amazing can be found as early as the first century. The easy-to-learn, difficult-to-master battle system, the addictive nature of catching, evolving, and training Pokemon, the setting that provides a world unseen before in any other video game, it's just all so good. It's easy to get wrapped up in nostalgia when talking about this game, and sure, while the graphics graphics and sound design haven't aged well, and the game has some very severe balance issues and bugs, I truly believe that this remains as not only one of the high points of the Pokemon franchise, but one of the all-time great JRPGs. <laughs> things that fills me with the most nostalgia when it comes to early Pokemon has to be the soundtrack. Seriously, when we were playing this game, I forgot just how many pieces of music were stuck in the back of my mind that I couldn't help but hum along to when I played. Just listen to a few of these earworms. You see what I mean? Any of these themes would be a standout piece of music from any other video game, but in Pokemon, you have a song like these for every occasion. Visually is where Pokemon Red and Blue really do show some signs of struggle. Now, the official art style for Pokemon, characters, and location are all absolutely stellar. However, there is a little bit of an issue when it comes to bringing them to life on an original Game Boy. The overworld locations aren't bad. In fact, I think they have a pretty good look to them and are rather iconic at this point. However, the battle screens really do leave a lot to be desired. Just look at the animation on attacks. And look at the way some of these Pokemon look in their sprite work. Oh, Goldbat, are you okay? Wigglytuff, just, just, oh, why? And Machoke. 
Look at how they massacred my boy. The default color palette for this game is also gray, which can be a little bit boring to look at after a while. However, when playing this game on a Game Boy Color, GBA, or the Virtual Console release, a color mode is available. Another area that red and blue really start to show their age is with a plethora of bugs and glitches. And holy fuck, are there a lot of glitches. Thankfully, most of them can be safely avoided, and the majority of the game-breaking ones were patched out with the English release. However, there are still plenty of ones to find. Cloning Pokemon, getting Safari-exclusive Pokemon out outside of the zone, having doors warp the player to the end of the game, there is really no end to the amount of useful exploits in this game. Probably the most notable one would be the missing no glitch, and what that can do for the player. By following some simple steps, which include talking to this old man in Viridian, and flying to Cinnabar Island and surfing up and down the coast, you can spawn a glitch Pokemon, missing no, that could cause certain graphical quirks and help you duplicate items. Is it easy to do? Yeah. Is it still kind of fun? Of course. These glitches aren't going to ruin anybody's time, short of potential save corruption, which isn't uncommon, but they are still something to take note of with Pokemon Red and Blue. Pokemon Red and Blue takes place in the Kanto region, both named and based off the real-world counterpart in Japan. As a setting, Kanto is easily one of the most iconic worlds that gaming has to offer. You won't find a vast array of different biomes, but instead a believable and cohesive world that still provides some of the most memorable landmarks and locations in Nintendo's catalog. Who can honestly forget the atmosphere of Viridian Forest, the trek through Mount Moon, or the creepiness of the Pokemon Tower? The towns each have their own vibe to them that I really enjoy too, from the humbleness of Pallet Town and Viridian City, to the bustling areas of Celadon and Saffron City, Plus, the comfort that being inside of a Pokemon Center gives you is nearly unmatched from any other game. All of these iconic locations that not only stand out from other offerings on the Game Boy, but ones that have stuck with players decades after they have experienced them. One of the things that helps bring the world of Kanto alive is the story. Now, the overall plot of Red and Blue Story is rather unremarkable as a tale of a young trainer who sets out on a journey to be the best like no one ever was. Along the way, they'll encounter many tough trainers, have continual run-ins with their rival, and thwart the nefarious Team Rocket. The thing that makes the story of this game so memorable are the moments and set pieces. Infiltrating Silphco to stop Team Rocket, helping the deceased Marowak spirit find peace, rubbing the back of the sick sea captain of the SSN. Alright, that one's a little weird, but still. Red and Blue doesn't focus on the strong narrative, but instead a collection of memorable moments that are loosely strung together that I ultimately think works out really well. One of the main driving forces behind encouraging the player to get out and explore the world is the completion of the Pokedex. Now, the Pokedex acts as a bestiary of sorts that catalogs all Pokemon countered by the player, with additional information to those that the player has obtained. It is definitely worth going out of your way to complete the Pokedex, not for a reward of any sort, unless you have a Game Boy printer to print a physical copy of a diploma proving your completion, but for the lore nuggets included in each new entry. These each give so much character to the many different Pokemon that you can encounter in the game, and can make the fantasy of each battle even more memorable. Memorable. The Pokemon are the real stars of the show in regards to the game's cast. There are 151 of these creatures that populate the Kanto region, each with their own individual design and natural behavior elaborated through NPC dialogue, as well as within the Pokedex. With the sheer number of Pokemon, most people are bound to find one that they at least like somewhat. You have cute ones, badass ones, and ones that look like they come from the deepest depths of your nightmares. On your journey, you'll come across plenty of notable interactions with Pokemon for story purposes, such as the Snorlax blocking the player's way on occasion, the the talking Nidorino who turns out to be Bill, and the ever-important decision many gamers have to make, who was your starter Pokemon? A decision that has both gameplay implications, as well as caused a fair share of lunchroom arguments during the popularity of this game's initial release. When it comes to our rival, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that this incarnation from Red and Blue is easily the most iconic in the series. Blue, Gary, dumbass, or whatever you want to call him, works for one simple reason. He's a complete dick. He's not like the rivals from the modern day Pokemon games who will heal your team up, shower you in items, and just be buddy-buddy with the player. No, your rival will show up at the most inconvenient times like at the end of dungeons, right before you encounter Giovanni, and even right after facing the Elite Four as their champion. He will actively get items and rub it in the player's face to try to impede their progress. Best of all, He's a complete jerk the whole game, constantly taunting the player throughout the whole game, telling them to smell you later. <laughs> they do a great job of making this guy really unlikable. Your rival isn't the only constant thorn in the player's side, as you will have multiple run-ins with the criminal organization Team Rocket throughout your journey. Team Rocket's goals are simple, steal Pokemon for profit, which will ultimately help them take over the world. What I like about Team Rocket is really the effect you see that they have on Kanto. During the player's quest, you'll find them occupying Mount Moon, the Celadon Game Corner, and the majority of Saffron City 
Bowie, which really show how much of a menace they are to go up against. While the team may lack in memorable characters, they definitely make up for it in their leader, Giovanni, being both an intimidating figure, while also having sort of a mini redemption as he concedes to the player's skill multiple times throughout the game. You only encounter him a few times, but those times are still impactful enough for him to be seen as one of Pokemon's greatest antagonists. <laughs> of Kanto is decently large, with the player moving around the world from a top-down perspective, much like a traditional JRPG. Throughout the game, there will be many environments that will pose a challenge to the player to navigate. First and foremost is what causes battles to occur. Outside of scripted mandatory encounters, players can occasionally go up against other trainers by moving into their field of view, or a wild Pokemon if stepping into an area where random battles can occur. What is interesting is the decision that the player can make in regards to avoiding these encounters by typically having the direct route being blocked by a trainer, while having the slightly more indirect route be covered in grass for random encounters. This causes players to weigh their options and choose which one they rather face. HMs also turn up a little bit later in the game. These allow players to light up dark caves, cut down small trees, move boulders, swim across bodies of waters, and even fly to previously visited locations. They can be a little intrusive with the need to take up a Pokemon's move in order to perform, but the moves themselves can be decent and are relatively harmless enough. One of the key areas that you'll come across while playing Pokemon Red and Blue are the myriad of dungeons spread throughout Kanto. These are some of the highlights of the game for me, especially when compared to more recent generations of Pokemon that seem to have scaled back the number and complexity of these levels. I mean, just take a look at Sylphscope for an example of how expansive a dungeon can be in this game. Look at how many floors there are. Or look at the door flipping puzzles and ledge jumping spots you need to do in the Pokemon Mansion on Cinnabar Island. Or how about the optional dungeons in the later parts of the game such as the Seafoam Isles, Power Plant, and Cerulean Cave. Not every dungeon has this level of complexity. Some, such as the SSN and the Pokemon Tower, are pretty straightforward. Hell, Diglett Cave is literally just a straight line. But even those do have some cool world building implications, and I think they fit right into the world. The player can find a ton of useful items in Pokemon. There's the standard RPG items you'd expect, like potions to recover HP, items to heal status effects, and battle items to increase primary stats in a pinch. There are also some more permanent items for incremental stat boosts, and even items that allow Pokemon to learn new moves. These are both limited in usage, unfortunately, so you have to choose which Pokemon you want to use them on wisely. There also exist several key items that let you do a number of things, such as getting an XP boost for your entire party, travel quickly on a bike, or even detect ghosts in the Pokemon Tower. Point is, there are a lot of items in this game, so it makes me kind of sad to say one of the biggest sticking points I have with Red and Blue is its inventory management. You have a very limited number of item slots available, and they fill up fast. Thankfully, you can store items on your PC at the Pokemon Center to free up some space, and I can't recommend you do this enough because the amount of times I've been halfway through a dungeon and had to leave some items laying on the ground because my inventory was too full happened far too often. The real meat and potatoes of Pokemon Red and Blue's gameplay is its battle system. These take on the role of standard turn-based RPG encounters. Battles are comprised of one-on-one -on -one encounters between two Pokemon with a team of up to six on each side. During battle, the player has four options. The first is Fight, which changes to a screen that shows up to four different moves that a particular Pokemon knows. These can range from physical and special damaging moves to status effects. The next option is Pokemon, which allows the player to swap out their current Pokemon to another one in their party. This is very important for leveling, as well as switching into another Pokemon that may be able to take a punch better than the one currently selected. Next is Item, which is pretty self-explanatory, allowing the player to use one of the many items in their inventory to either help heal or catch a Pokemon. Finally, there is always the option to run, which is really only useful for wild Pokemon battles, but can help speed up some of the more populated random encounter areas. A simple battle system on its surface, but something that I still believe stands strong today. To add a little complexity to the battle formula, both Pokemon and their respective moves also belong to a type. These range from the standard elements that you'd expect, such as fire, water, and electricity, to less standard types, such as ghost, psychic, and dragon. There are 15 different types, each with their own strengths and weaknesses in terms of common stat spreads, but also with how effective they are towards one another. This is essentially the biggest game of rock, paper, scissors, as certain types will be completely ineffective against some, but super effective against others. For example, ground moves will be completely unable to affect flying types, while they will absolutely decimate an Electric-type Pokémon. Some Pokémon, such as Rhydon, Gyarados, and Exeggutor, actually have a dual typing that further flushes out effective strategies. The type chart on screen is essentially how each Pokémon in Gen 1 lines up with each other. Study it, learn it, live it. This creates a cycle of certain Pokémon being more effective than others in certain situations, which encourages the player to build an incredibly diverse team of Pokémon. Catching Pokémon is such a big part of the appeal that the whole tagline for the series 
gotta catch them all, has been hardwired into all of our brains for over 20 years now. But seriously, catching and collecting Pokemon is some of the absolute most fun you can have in this series. The feeling that the player gets the first time encountering a new wild Pokemon and the desire to catch them was something that took other games years to replicate and some would probably say they still don't even come close to how much fun it is to do in Pokemon. Whenever a wild Pokemon appears, you can use a Pokeball to try to catch it. Now the chance is rather small at first, but by lowering the Pokemon's HP, applying a status effect, or by using a better Pokeball, you can increase those odds. This may not be necessary for some of the weaker Pokemon like Rattata and Caterpie, but for some Pokemon such as any of the legendary birds or Snorlax, they're gonna take a little bit more work to catch. It's a good system, that's only major flaw is that if your Pokemon box and your PC is full, and you haven't switched it over to a new one, you may miss out on the ability of catching certain Pokemon. So Pokemon can actually level up from their base level of 1 all the way up to level 100. On each level up, a Pokemon will receive stat boots to their primary attributes, and as they level up, they will also learn new moves that they could use during battle sequences. Most iconically is the game's use of evolution as a mechanic. See, after certain Pokemon reach a particular level or are given one of the evolutionary stones, they can evolve into a Pokemon that is more powerful. These evolutionary forms usually come with increased stats, a new move pool, and completely different designs. They also exist EV training of sorts, and those unfamiliar with competitive Pokemon might be a little shocked to hear how different it was back in the day. I won't get too much into the math, but the gist of what you need to know is that after knocking out a particular Pokemon on a battle, you get the stat experience equal to the base stats of the Pokemon you just knocked out. This will carry on even after your Pokemon reach level 100, and while it can definitely make your Pokemon more powerful, it is ultimately seen as a tedious and unnecessary thing to do in the modern era. So after you've caught all the Pokemon you want, and you've trained them up to a decent degree, it's time to decide how you want all the pieces to fit together. Now in the base game of Red and Blue, you really don't need to worry about much outside of type advantage as long as you are doing a good job of keeping up in levels. However, you really can make an incredibly diverse team that has several archetypes with the 151 options available. Some Pokemon operate as walls, being able to soak up physical damage, some act as glass cannons that can absolutely destroy other trainers, and some can act as supports, setting up status effects and creating more advantageous situations. None of these roles are specifically stated in the game, instead they are slightly hinted at by the primary stats and types, but can also be determined by the moveset that you decide on. Building a diverse team around the different type of niches that a Pokemon can fill, plus having good type coverage and a unique move pool for Pokemon is essential for playing the game at a higher level. So one of the biggest quirks that Generation 1 has to offer is in regards to its balance of the game, or lack thereof. I'll go ahead and list a couple for you. First, types are mainly relegated to either physical types such as flying, rock, or poison, while special has types such as fire, psychic, and ice. Problem with that is some Pokemon would be less effective given that their strongest stats didn't exactly match up with the type that they were in. Speaking of issues with stats, in this game, special covers both offense and defense for special moves and types. This essentially allows psychic types to reign supreme, along with the fact that there was a distinct lack of decent bug and ghost type Pokemon and moves to counter them. Though Pokemon with high speed such as Persian also saw a lot of use considering that the critical hit chance was determined by the Pokemon's base speed stat. Finally, a lot of types really didn't get much in the way of decent offensive moves. None of these are necessarily game-breaking, but they definitely play a significant role when it comes to team composition. One of the more interesting features that Pokemon Red and Blue have to offer is how they connect with other games. So Red and Blue represent two halves of a whole game. You of course don't necessarily need to play both of them to get the full experience, but what these games offer mainly is just a slightly different cast of version-exclusive Pokemon that may give players more of a reason to swing towards one version or another. However, there is another method of obtaining these Pokemon, with the use of trading. See, by pulling out the Game Boy Link cable that everyone definitely had, you can trade Pokemon from Red version to Blue version, or vice versa. Some Pokemon can even evolve via training, which is a novel idea that makes replaying these older games a little bit annoying. These games can actually link together with other games too, including Pokemon Yellow if you wanted to move your Pokemon to those games, Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2 if you wanted to battle your caught Pokemon in a 3D arena, and Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal if you wanted to bring them into the next generation of the series. The side content of Pokemon has always been one of the things that keeps players playing long after they've beaten the Elite Four, and the first game in the series are no exception to this. The Game Corner in Celadon City gave many children's first real taste of a gambling addiction in the hopes of earning rare Pokemon through the slots. The Safari Zone lets kids play a game of how many rocks can I throw at this stupid Chansey before it runs away, but the real draw of the side content in Red and Blue was catching the legendary Pokemon. The three legendary birds, Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres, could be encountered in the Seafoam Islands, Power Plant, and Victory 
Cherry Road respectively, and all posed a significant challenge for the player to catch. But the big one was exploring Cerulean Cave to find Mewtwo, a Pokemon hinted at in the Pokemon Mansion on Cinnabar Island. This is easily the most challenging Pokemon to catch, assuming you didn't save your Master Ball, and is ultimately seen as the final milestone when completing Pokemon Red and Blue. Nostalgia is a very powerful thing. It can sometimes be tough remembering something so fondly, only going back to seeing what was good before is seen as archaic now or worse, was never even good to begin with. You could take one look at Pokemon Red and Blue and think, yeah, this game looks long past its expiration date, and the advancements that the other entries have made in the series has kind of left this game in the dust. The graphics haven't aged well, the game is very buggy, and it's about as balanced as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. However, what I found in my return to Pokemon Red and Blue is still the fundamentals of strong combat, excellent world design, and an addictive gameplay loop that had me always wanting to experience more of what Kanto had to offer. This game won't be for everyone, and it's getting increasingly harder to find a legal copy with Nintendo's backwards way of thinking about game preservation. But for anyone who hasn't given these games a shot before, or someone who's been itching to get the classic Pokemon feel, I cannot recommend these games enough. It was an absolutely stellar trip down memory lane. After Pokemon Red and Blue released, the Pokemon franchise took the world by storm. The following years saw the release of the Pokemon trading card game, both an anime and manga adaptation, as well as dozens of spin-offs. The following year saw the release of Pokemon Yellow, a slightly updated release of Red and Blue that drew far more parallels from the anime that was running at the time. The next major release was Pokemon Gold and Silver in 1999 on the Game Boy Color, representing the second generation of Pokemon featuring a new region to explore, Pokemon to collect, and challenges to overcome. Unsurprisingly, these games were a massive success too, and they would serve as the blueprint for the new Pokemon generations to come. Pokemon games would continue to be developed with the third generation in 2002 on the GBA, which even saw updated remakes of the first generation games with the release of Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. More mainline games were released for the DS and 3DS before finding their way to home consoles on the Switch, which even saw another Gen 1 remake with the release of Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. The series has no signs of slowing down and has reached a near mythical status as far as IPs go. What the franchise has planned next remains to be seen, but one thing is for sure, there will be plenty more Pokemon games for years to come. But that's all I've got for you guys today, so thank you guys for watching. What are your thoughts on Pokemon Red and Blue? Please be sure to leave your thoughts in the comment section down below, and hey, if you enjoyed today's video, maybe consider giving it a like and subscribing. Thank you guys again, and I'll catch you in the next video.